Welcome to the EIAS webcast on Hong Kong's future and implications for the European Union and cross-trade relations. As a prime interconnected financial hub, the EIAS webcast will discuss Hong Kong's trade and economic aspects post-COVID-19 with a focus on European Hong Kong and cross-trade relations. The chair of today is Mr. Eric Famai, Senior Associate at the EIAS. The speakers of today are Dr. Harry Tsung, representative of the Taipei Representative Office to the European Union in Belgium, Dr. Kerry Brown, Professor at the King's College London, United Kingdom, Dr. Yi Chung Lai, President at the Prospect Foundation. The Q&A moderator of today is Mr. Stuart Lau, Europe correspondent for the South Chinese Morning Post. The webcast will start with an introduction on the subject made by our chair, Mr. Eric Fame. When Beijing appears to nibble at Hong Kong's famous freedoms, the EU voices concern. But when Beijing threatens to take control of Taiwan by other means, if the peaceful way is resisted, we do not move an eyelash. Hong Kong's freedoms matter, but let us also nurture Taiwan. After all, we benefit from Taiwan's many contributions to the world. Think of Taiwan's house as was a model for the rest of the world. But when the WHO chose to mute Taiwan's advice, the EU did not complain. Taiwan excels not only in medical care, you know they make the most and the best computer chips in the world. And more relevant to this discussion, Taiwan displays a vibrant democracy at a time when democracy is under attack everywhere else. Now the EU seems to acknowledge this. Ursula von der Leyen congratulated Taiwan for, quote unquote, having a high turnout at its recent presidential election. But then the EU member states continue to deny the chosen government of diplomatic recognition. It is a deafening silence, even while Beijing tells Taiwan that losing its autonomy is historically inevitable. In the short run, the West can continue this hypocrisy with impunity. In the long run, we may come to regret for not speaking up. Of course, this situation is not of the EU's making as it is based on the United Nations consensus. But it is too much to expect from the Commission with fresh geopolitical ambitions to make a stance for fairness. I'm hopeful. Thumbs up for the lone voices in the European Parliament that do speak up. And hopefully some EU government leaders will also raise their voice in time. The EU can afford to look away, at least for now. But this is not the case of business. The decision of HSBC and Standard Chartered Bank to welcome the imposition of the security law over the heads of Hong Kong's parliament is a chilling example. Both banks' business livelihood was at stake. Hong Kong's former chief executive made that quite clear. I would therefore describe the picture of HSBC's boss signing the petition to adopt the security law as let me use the banking term, a derivative forced confession, something all too familiar to Hong Kong people. HSBC and Standard Chartered face an impossible choice. Now the board and other international banks have better prepare. They will not escape the same dilemma. We all want to do business in China and your allegiance will be duly tested. Whether you're a big bank, an airline, a tech company, or even an SME. In conclusion for the EU, there is a wide gap between politicians who feel they can come away with a targeted response and the company CEOs who feel compelled to sign on the dotted line. Public opinion of what is fair and what is wrong can steer this either way. Black Lives Matter demonstrates that sentiment can shift in an instant. And this is where information, disinformation, and propaganda comes in. Think tanks have a very limited reach there. But we can give a platform for discussion and a voice to influencers and opinion makers. And that's what EIS is doing today. And with that, I would first like to invite Mr. Ambassador to give his opening remarks. 
I think uh, the discussion of Hong Kong today is uh, very different from what it was last year. Uh, it has shifted. We have shifted from one that could trace back to the Article 23 protest in 2003 and the Occupy Central in 2014. So one that is essentially different. In my view, I think the anti extradition protest is consistent with the previous demonstrations, as I said, starting from 2003, and it is part of the deficit. However, what we are going to see the forthcoming uh, national security law in Hong Kong is nothing short of a grand scenario that which is going to bring uh, what we have seen in Hong Kong to an end and to bring in a very uncertain future for Hong Kong. One has to wonder. Uh, whether we are still going to see a large number of Hong Kong people to take to the street to express um, their aspiration. I think before the national security law of Hong Kong, we ask when next. Hong Kong is full of uncertainty. Security, uh, I must say that uh, Mr. Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State of the United States, for the proposed national security law as the best nail for Hong Kong. Well, I don't think that's an exaggeration. Of course, the Chinese national, the, the Chinese officials argue that the proposed national security law uh, only affects a very small number of people in Hong Kong, and it, it will be able to improve the, the environment for business. Well, I don't think that is the case. Why? Because the law seems to stay out the purpose to stop, to prevent, to stop, and to punish uh, the crimes uh, involving secession, uh, subversion of stage, and uh, terrorism and foreign intervention. It means that the scope of the law is very broad. Potentially, it is going to affect uh, the, the, the local and international uh, religious organizations, local and foreign uh, NGOs working in Hong Kong, as well as the academic cooperations between local and foreign universities. This is a law that can incriminate uh, the failures just at the will of the Chinese leaders. And to see this as no different from the other legislation in the basic law is really, um, is really uh, to downplay uh, the significance of it. Let's look at what happened after the anti uh, extradition demonstrations last year. It was surprising to me when I got this figure. And it is only official figure, and, and the, the, the fact may be even worse than that. See, out of the anti extradition protest last year, a total of 8,986, almost 9,000 people were arrested in Hong Kong, among which 1,754 were indicted. You will be surprised to know that among those arrested, 974 uh, were people between age 16 and 18, among which 182 were indicted. And those who are younger than 16 years old and were arrested, uh, counts one, uh, 635. 98 of them were indicted. And the three, uh, about crimes, the three top, top three crimes charged includes riot, holding offensive weapons, and illegal gathering. It's really uh, easy uh, for the new, the newly proposed national security law to charge people of those crimes and to indict them. 
The EU's policy toward Hong Kong is, of course, to support one country, two systems. Because one country, two systems, perhaps, is the best scenario for the Hong Kong people. And the problem is uh, the commitment under one country uh, was not honored and was eroded and was violated by China. But for Taiwan, I must uh, emphasize that one country, two system as a formula of which was originally designed for Taiwan has never been accepted by the Taiwanese people. Uh, in the, uh, the inaugural address uh, by President Tsai, she made it very clear that we are opposed to the Chinese uh, government using the so-called one country, two systems to downgrade Taiwan. We are already an aut autonomous uh, country, and to use uh, one country, two systems to apply uh, to Taiwan is totally uh, unacceptable. Next speaker is uh, Professor Dr. Brown in, uh, in London. Please go ahead. It is nearly 25 years uh, since the handover of uh, Hong Kong to uh, China from the UK. Uh, and so we are halfway, broadly halfway through the handover period, the, the, the kind of transition period. And I suppose you have to recognize that the arrangement, the Sino-British uh, arrangement in 1984 and then the basic law uh, from 1990, I think 1991, um, and then all of the negotiations towards the end of uh, uh, the handover, the sort of before 1997, um, these really we're at a time that is uh, distant in our memory now. Uh, the big, big change, I suppose, is that I don't think anyone up to 1997 really thought um, that China would change as much as it has in terms of its economy. Uh, at that time, we have to remember that it was um, a much smaller economy than the UK. Uh, I mean, the Hong Kong economy was about 23, 24% of the whole size of the Chinese economy. And uh, now that's, I think, about 2 or 3%. And um, now the UK is dwarfed by the Chinese economy. And so this is really, I don't think, ever something that was contemplated at the time. Um, and it wasn't factored, certainly, in discussions over the handover. Um, and it's interesting to imagine what might have happened were anyone to have an inkling that, in fact, this would be the transformation we would see. Um, and it, it sort of means that the 50-year period has shrunk. And I, uh, I suppose one of the first things I, I sort of say is that I feel like the Chinese government is acting as though the 50-year agreement was a 25-year agreement and the one country, two systems is, is kind of just rhetoric now. Um, I mean, it, it, its behavior is as though the one country, two systems sort of is uh, a different kind of meaning to that which, for instance, the UK and others and still have of it. So that's been one of the arguments between the UK and China about violation of treaty. Um, and also about the big argument about, well, you know, does Beijing sort of, it, it's claiming with this new law uh, that it's proposing at the National People's Congress um, that its responsibilities are security, that what has happened in Hong Kong has been a security issue, that this is something that's within its remit. So these have become sort of arguments really about who in the end has real responsibility and control over Hong Kong and it's clear that Beijing thinks that that is a 100% it and you know if it needs to do things it will do them uh, and it is not going to abide particularly by the spirit of the, two, uh, of the uh, 1997 agreement um, it may abide by the letter but not the spirit and that's the sort of issue that we see in China's uh, you know, regard, for instance, the WTO and other things, you know, the bite, the letter, maybe technically for the spirit it seems to sometimes uh, ignore. The UK has limited uh, kind of traction now um, because of its position after leaving the European Union. Uh, where it's still part of the European Union, to be honest, it would be able to use its influence within the European Union to maybe have a tougher response to Hong Kong because it's you know, UK has got a lot of experience with Hong Kong, obviously, but now it's out of the European Union. That means that it's had to take unilateral measures. Um, two of them, which have been most interesting 
the five the, the four the statement by Australia, Canada, America, and uh, the UK is quite interesting, uh, condemning what was happening with the new law proposed, and the second uh, was the offer of a sort of citizenship status for Hong Kong residents. Um, the first, I suppose, has symbolic value. The second, it does have symbolic value, but I have to be sceptical about how viable it really is. For one simple reason, the British government under Boris Johnson justified exiting the EU as taking back control, particularly over immigration, and it seems a bizarre thing that they then start to propose the most radical kind of immigration opening that we have seen in modern times. I therefore think that this, at the moment, should only be treated as rhetoric, and I'm sure that people in Hong Kong also, that they like the solidarity from this move, are probably um, the, the most desirable outcome for them is to be able to stay in Hong Kong. I mean, I don't think their desire is to leave their home. So uh, I think while it may be a good solidarity move, it's not really um, a, a kind of, I think, a, a very practical thing. Um, the second, I guess, the area is, you know, kind of the situation in Hong Kong now. Um, well, I would look at a very good report in The Economist uh, last week, so that was the, I suppose, the sort of 10th of June, and we have to look at the viability of the financial markets and the way in which they operate. And I think that's where we're going to kind of see, if we get any compromise from Beijing, that's where we'll see it. So the connection with business is an important one, because at the moment, uh, it seems that these particular markets, um, you know, kind of derivatives and equities and things like that, are functioning and have not been impacted. Um, it is possible that they will be impacted uh, if there is continuing political uncertainty. And when that happens, the kind of whole situation changes because, you know, Hong Kong's transformation from 1997 has not just been in its political and geopolitical kind of vocation, but also in the incredible internationalization of the Hong Kong financial market, which is not often noted. It seems a strange thing that it... Um, you know, it was a market before 1997, for sure, in a big finance centre, but it's really an international kind of interface now between China and the rest of the world, and that's really where it gets its viability and power. And if what is happening now starts to really erode that, then we have a, a, I mean, a very significant change. So, I mean, you kind of have to look at these two stories. The political story of the demonstrations and everything is well known and well covered, this story of the uh, financial uh, viability, the rule of law, these kind of things in Hong Kong, in the finance area, is not so well covered, but that is, I think, the one that's going to be decisive. So we have to remember those two stories. Very finally, um, the issue of what this means for, uh, you know, kind of the wider world and particularly for Taiwan. Um, there's always loss and gain uh, from what China is doing. And um, I suppose its calculation in Beijing under Xi Jinping is, again, is control over Hong Kong. I mean, a, a kind of unequivocal, um, strong statement that, uh, you know, this is Beijing's issue. It is tired of people interfering in its affairs. This is, this is its, um, I think it's language. I'm not saying I agree with this, but this is its language. Um, that this is, you know, now China runs Chinese affairs even under a special administrative region framework. And I think it would regard the control it's got now as a victory. Um, I have to say, though, that it has also been a loss. Um, not, of course, for the international impact of the issues in Hong Kong, uh, which are harder to quantify, but because of the very clear way it seems that this has impacted on views in Taiwan. Um, I was in Taiwan in early January, during the build-up to the presidential election uh, with Taiwan, so, uh, stood against uh, Han Guoyu, and um, it was exciting that her political fortunes had really been restored by what had been happening in Hong Kong because of the sense of a stronger Taiwanese identity. So I think we need to interpret Hong Kong's recent happenings as a kind of sort of two-track story. Uh, one is that Beijing has con increased control of what it can control, but I think the short, medium, and long term of this is that it has made 
its vision of how to solve the Taiwanese issue, I mean, its vision, Beijing's vision, um, really hard to sort of, you know, kind of see, see not, you know, it, it's kind of getting out of reach. It, it's the sort of, you know, this is the thing that the Xi Jinping leadership seems to want most of all from notion of, you know, reunification, this is its great desire. And yet, in Hong Kong, it's kind of given an advert for why that, that is not, um, palatable. Uh, and the Hong Kong needs 23 million citizens in Hong Kong. Have a stro- uh, sorry, um, the Taiwanese 23 million uh, citizens in Taiwan have a very strong sense of identity now, which is being reinforced by what they've seen. So with that, we move to Taiwan, where we have president of the Trusted Foundation, Dr. Yi Chung Lai. There were presidents in the past that uh, when China uh, decided that if they are able to uh, uh, take care of each of Hong Kong, then the next will be Taiwan. So we saw that presidents in 19, uh, from 1997, July the 1st, when uh, Hong, uh, Hong Kong returned to China, and uh, the lead of the events all the way to the uh, 1999, uh, at that time there was a rumors about the, uh, the, the public third group on talk that Wang Dahan will be able to I will come to time to take the unification proposal, uh, and at that time for the, in order to impose the, the circle on top as a kind of unification negotiation. So the, uh, uh, the pre- of course, at that time that the President Li Zhenghui, uh, on July the 1st, uh, on July 1999 decided to first stake out Taiwan's position, and, and the whole episode then disappeared. So that was the, uh, the, uh, the President about how Hong Kong and Taiwan connected, and especially about the uh, assertion that uh, uh, China believed that when they hand, uh, take care of Hong Kong, then the next thing that they will uh, come to Taiwan and take care of Taiwan. So that's, that's how, uh, the sensitivity that Taiwan has about Hong Kong. Another thing is that uh, when we look at Hong Kong today, uh, although Hong Kong is effectively a part of China, but uh, the two systems also ensure that it remains a very unique status uh, within China. So that it is inside China, part of China, but also not really part of China. Uh, to a certain extent, it's like uh, the West Berlin during the Cold War era. And which means that uh, for Taiwan, if the, uh, uh, we are sitting there and the see the free world is uh, letting uh, China, uh, China to help Hong Kong uh, without any effort, uh, just, just walk by and take over it, uh, it will be equivalent like uh, the um, uh, the United States and Western World at that time just watched over how the Soviet Union swallowed the whole West Berlin. And that will bring the issue about Taiwan's confidence. Uh, if the China decided to attack Taiwan, then, uh, what kind of uh, assurance that we can have about the, uh, and the free loving countries, uh, will come to assist Taiwan? So this is another, uh, issue that on a lot of people's minds in Taiwan that, uh, the, uh, the way that the, uh, the world is handling um, the issue in China, uh, in Hong Kong. That uh, how that world reflects uh, the um, implication about their response to Taiwan. So those are the two, I think, uh, one of the main uh, concerns uh, that drive about the uh, Taiwan's uh, concern about uh, Hong Kong. Then uh, when we talk about the national security legislation uh, uh, in Hong Kong, I think the issue is. Uh, more about the, the way that China uh, handles the national security legislation, because the way that China is doing right now is to enact uh, a law and totally by National People's Congress, and then uh, put that law uh, into the appendix of the basic uh, Hong Kong basic law. So that uh, uh, by doing this, the, uh, this gave the China the, the, the leeway to effectively change the basic law by itself thus uh, effectively eliminating the one country, two system. <clears throat> and uh, if the, uh, China this time is able to, uh, to go through the national security legislation uh, in this way, then probably China could, uh, that will enable China to do similar things in other issues, to effectively change the basic law again and again and again uh, through its own initiative right uh, in Beijing. So that's uh, so the whole concern about the national security legislation uh, right now, it's more about the way uh, yeah, China passes it, rather than the, uh, right now the content of it. Because effectively, or technically, right now the national security legislation hasn't really been there. Uh, and uh, all we need to 
have is that probably we need to wait until the August when the National People's Congress Permanent Committee they come out with a draft on national security uh, legislation, then we'll, uh, we are able to know the exact content of it. But of course, judging from the past record and the uh, guideline that we have been passed uh, this uh, June, uh, this May, that uh, there is no confidence about that the, uh, how the, the kind of the national security legislation uh, passed by China that will uh, really uh, ensure the net, uh, security uh, in Hong Kong. So probably the more of the human rights and other the freedom condition that will be improved uh, because of this. Then uh, I think the next uh, issue is that how should we do? Uh, what could help uh, about the to ameliorate or to deal with the situation? I think right now, in addition to the international concern and the voices of the support uh, for the Hong Kong people to to help them to uh, have the right and uh, have the capability to determine our future. I think it's important to really work on the, uh, the national security legislation itself. First of all, I think if uh, we have enough pressure, probably, uh, hopefully, that uh, we will be able to influence uh, the uh, part, uh, internal political uh, process so that the national security legislation uh, as it came out will be not as harsh, at least so that we can soften the content. I think probably this is a thing uh, that uh, international community we could do uh, first. And second, I think it is also important for the international community to, to ask that you know, in order for China to really uh, get rid of uh, the international suspicion that, that Beijing is uh, about to throw out the one country two system, make this legislation need to have the passage of the Hong Kong uh, Legislative, uh, Legislative Council. So that uh, because right now the whole uh, process that China has is to have this uh, legislation passed uh, by the National People's Congress and then uh, put that as part of the appendix in the Hong Kong Basic Law. Uh, we need to let the, uh, uh, if we are able to insist that this process need to have the consent uh, and uh, also the, uh, uh, the formality of the Hong Kong Legislative Council's approval, then at least we, are, we will be able to uh, retain the kind of the remaining uh, control, at least through the Hong Kong legislative uh, organ. I think that is an important, although uh, we do know that in Hong Kong, the, uh, uh, we just, the, uh, the China still uh, has its control about the majority of the Hong Kong legislative council. But in formality, at least, we should insist on the Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kong legislative council that it represented all Hong Kong people, they should have a say about this whole process. They should have a say about the content of this legislation. Now, the third, I, I think it's important also to demand uh, and to ask that uh, this uh, legislation uh, should not be retroactive. So th because we're not a lot of rumors, uh, a lot of suspicions that this legislation could, uh, uh, if, if, should it be effective, it will have the retroactive and start to trace back about some of the behavior that this legislation, uh, that this legislation deemed in, um, inappropriate. And they'll incriminate, uh, some of the offenders they believe, uh, they, they did the, uh, this offense in the past. So that's, uh, that's another, uh, thing that, uh, international community, uh, when we focus on the national security legislation, that, uh, it should be another very important, uh, requirement. I think in final, uh, although there are a lot of issues that the Hong Kong and how the China is uh, eliminating the one country two system step by step, but I but I think right now, uh, in order to stop this landslide and also to get the uh, the support uh, for our uh, friends in Hong Kong, that the fight on national security legislation is important. Uh, probably will not be able, to be able to be successful, but the process. And also, the, uh, the longer we're able to accumulate the momentum uh, for the, uh, um, to get the support on, uh, for the Hong Kong people's side, that will uh, make some impact. And at least it will have uh, a certain uh, consequence. Let the Beijing government know that they just cannot just do it uh, without suffering any consequence. And so those, those are my views. Thank you very much. I think we can... Uh... Um, go on with uh, starting the discussion and the Q&A, and for that, um, Stuart, it's all yours, please.
you know, Representative Zhang, uh, lots of questions for you. Very interesting presentation. Of course, you have a very um, important role to play in Taipei about um, the, the very limitations or the very challenges, if you may, um, about international participation for Taiwan. We've seen Taiwan trying to get into a World Health Organization, but um, not really getting into a vote. We've seen Beijing taking down Taiwan's diplomatic allies one by one. When you move back to Taipei, what will be your strategy? The uh, foreign policy in Taiwan is not formulated in one day. It has been in place for many years. We will be able to find uh, uh, different strategies here and there according to the international uh, support. Um, as what we have seen this year, um, that we have enjoyed much greater support from Taiwan to uh, be able to join the World Health Assembly. Uh, but in some cases, uh, if we are not seeing uh, the international support mature, we we need to be very cautious as well. The challenge for Taiwan uh, to uh, participate is to have a greater participation in the international community uh, is always there. And it is not a new issue to the diplomats in Taiwan. Uh, we have been able to see a progress in uh, here in Europe in the past uh, few years. Uh, when I was here, three, more than a little bit more than three years. We have seen the debate on China shifted from one that is uh, uh, much more friendly in tone to one that is much more cautious and uh, less friendly to China. Uh, of course, uh, EU uh, is very reluctant to uh, take sides with uh, either China or the United States. But just look at the EU itself. There is an evolution of the EU policy toward China, starting to see China as a systemic rival, etc. Um, as a very famous uh, uh, member of the European Parliament, Mr. Budikov says, you cannot see the other side as a systemic rival on Monday, and then on Thursday or Friday, uh, you can be back to business as usual. It is something that would be um, very much um, instilled into your relationship and that would uh, affect the long-term uh, interaction and relations between, uh, between EU and China. So as the representative of the Taiwanese government in the EU, of course it would be very difficult to get any sort of political recognition from Europe, maybe with the exception of um, um, some oh. Czech politician. Um, but, I mean, overall, where do you see the, the sort of areas where Taiwan and the EU could perhaps collaborate? I mean, in politically insensitive, non-sensitive areas, what would be your strategy for, for, for your successor? Well, when I came over in May 2017, it was before uh, the 19th Party Congress. Um, I think if one, if one to look at the one event that becomes a modern change, I think the 19th Party Congress uh, in Beijing, uh, which took place in, in October 2017, uh, should be the one. Especially after that, uh, Mr. Xi Jinping, uh, you know, uh, he abolished the term for uh, the president uh, in China. And, you know, basically giving himself an indefinite time to be the head of uh, China. Uh, that has changed uh, the atmosphere between uh, EU and China and any other part of the world with China. Well, uh, what are the areas that we have potential to develop relations with EU? Uh, just look at what happened and it's still ongoing with uh, COVID-19. Uh, the fact that Taiwan can weather very uh, swiftly well, should, I shouldn't use the word smoothly, but we uh, have achieved a, a much better result out of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic than most of the countries in the world. But because of, uh, number one, uh, we have uh, the, the system, the political system we have that allows transparency, that allows the cooperation between the government and the people, that actually is a very important factor for our success. And also it tells you uh, the potential of our manufacturers that we can become the number two figures um, 
um, manufacturing countries uh, of physical markets in the world to bring up our production capability from 1.8 million per day to 30 million pieces of physical markets per day. That tells you, of, that tells you how much, uh, how strong uh, we can be in our manufacturing industry. Uh, for those, we are able to find uh, less sensitive issues to work with. From that, you can see that the digital tool is also something that helps us uh, to achieve a very, uh, much better result in uh, our fighting with the coronavirus pandemic. Um, so, digital economy, we have strength. Uh, we, uh, um, we are uh, doing our utmost to develop a testing kit and then uh, you know, uh, the vaccine. This is also the area that we can work together. As uh, we, we have said that uh, the health uh, is a global uh, public uh, health issue, should, uh, should uh, be apolitical. That Taiwan that can make a few contributions to the global public health should not be uh, neglected. So uh, we have many areas where we can find a great potential for Taiwan to uh, make a few contributions to the international community, not only to EU, uh, much more so to the best developed countries uh, in uh, African countries, for example. We, we should not be uh, putting aside at the expense of those countries that can use Taiwan's assistance. That's why I want to say that. Good opportunity to move on to um, Dr. Lai on um, cross trade relations more specifically. Um, of course, in the last two sessions uh, in Beijing, there was a lot of concern about um, the military rhetoric um, used by the Beijing authorities, uh, whether it's a peaceful reunification or whether it's just reunification, and then um, a lot of concerns about, you know, the future of um, the cross trade relations, the, the peaceful situation we have right now. Um, what is the, can you give us a sense of the, the reaction in Taiwan and how Taiwanese policymakers and how Taiwanese people think about the military future? I think the uh, issue about the uh, the recent um, activities uh, by China, whether about the military, uh, uh, the rhetoric on the military action on Taiwan or the actual military uh, harassment uh, against Taiwan, especially like uh, uh, this uh, earlier uh, earlier this week and uh, uh, late last week, and also uh, today, uh, we saw several the Chinese fighter jets just. Uh, um, Approaching uh, Taiwan's uh, ADIZ and uh, make uh, have all kind of harassment that we have uh, right now. We uh, we do notice that the uh, increasing uh, references to the military means uh, for unification, and uh, we also notice that uh, probably out of the concern for the the raising rhetoric uh, within China that uh, Beijing uh, has all an authorized. Uh, several hawkish uh, generals uh, to calm down uh, the uh, uh, the so-called the uh, uh, military action on Taiwan uh, uh, rhetoric, but um, um, we do notice that there's a subtle change in those positions. Uh, although those hawkish uh, generals they uh, tell everyone that uh, right now probably it's not the time uh, to exercise the military power on Taiwan or the so-called Wu Tong that military. Uh, uh, of unification, but uh, they do in, increase the um, likelihood of the unification in part of the unification means and portfolio. So that this is the thing that uh, uh, we uh, pay special attention to, and uh, the way that uh, they are increasing uh, their military activities across the Taiwan Straits and also in Taiwan densities uh, since January all the way to uh, June. That uh, it's, it's the frequency and also the capability that's way over than uh, what he conducted uh, in the uh, two year 2018 and year 2019. So yes, uh, there's a concern here, but uh, all the things that we believe is that um, we need to strengthen ourselves. Uh, we need to uh, strengthen our uh, security partnership with the important partner like United States, Japan, and other like-minded countries. Uh, and also we need to stay united within uh, Taiwan. Uh, because the uh, COVID-19 um, episode really tells the people in Taiwan that um, although Taiwan is not a big, a very big country, but uh, when we are able to unite and uh, work together, we can 
uh, achieve a lot of very many amazing things. And uh, we are a capable country. So I think this is the another um, the new development within Taiwan. That in the past, when the Taiwanese people uh, look at all those uh, military harassment by China, uh, there are the uh, there will always be people that uh, oh, we just cannot fight against China, so we just uh, just bend over and uh, surrender. But right now, I think that with this uh, coronavirus uh, issues, that uh, there's a new sense of the confidence uh, within the Taiwan society. And the new Taiwan consensus started to form up so that uh, people started to believe that uh, we can stay alert and vigilant. Uh, we, we have already built a re, uh, very resilient society and we can withheld uh, the threat from China. Thank you, Dr. Lai. And uh, I think that brings me to another question to um, Professor Brown, actually, uh, which is about the similarity between the Taiwanese society and the Hong Kong pro-democracy society. Um, relying on outside support, like Taiwan would be asking themselves whether they can trust Washington under President Trump, or Hong Kong people would be asking whether they can trust, trust British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, which you just mentioned, seems to be doing something totally opposite to his anti-immigrant rhetoric. So um, how do you see the future of U.S. support, U.K. support, in um, sort of fighting back this authoritarian regime, if you like? Well, I mean, part of it's dependent on what happens in November this year in the U.S. elections. Um, and part of it is, I guess, dependent on what happens economically uh, as a result of COVID-19 and the impact of that in Europe and America, which is already very, very significant. Um, I suspect that these issues will be, uh, sort of they'll, they'll look different um, as we are clear about whether China is able to pull out of the economic problems more quickly than America or Europe. Um, because I think that kind of changes the parameters of the whole debate. Uh, you know, the kind of assumption has been uh, that, you know, the kind of capitalist system in Europe and America is very resilient. Um, but I think that China, if it does manage, and we don't know that, I mean, you know, it started some of these policies, but they're not, um, you know, they're, they're not anywhere near fruition. Um, if China does manage to restore growth and jobs more quickly than uh, Europe and America and elsewhere, it will regard socialism and Chinese characteristics as being absolutely viable and in, in, in kind of, you know, sort of, uh, sort of a, a dominant position. So, so I think that's a very, very big change. And that means that the support uh, that the, you know, Europeans and Americans offer to Hong Kong um, and, and Taiwan and, and other sort of area in the area is going to, I think, be impacted quite heavily by, by that, that economic narrative. I think um, another very interesting question that you also touched on in your presentation is about the future of UK-China relations. And um, we've seen a lot of hardening rhetoric, if you like, in the Parliament and even in Downing Street. But practically, are we going to see any changes in the future sort of dealing with China from London's perspective? Well, I mean, China is a huge player in the UK economically in terms of investment, as, as you know. Um, and so... You know, it's great that politicians are starting to think about China, um, but, but I mean, the knowledge levels are not huge. So, so I mean, I guess they've got to make sure that they pick their territory in which they want to engage with China. There are things that you can do and things that are not going to be possible. Um, I mean, the reality in Hong Kong is, and, and it's an unpalatable reality, I guess, that the various groups there are going to have to define their own, or have been defining their own political kind of vision in very, very tough circumstances. But, but it, in the end, it's their struggle, right? Um, and one of the problems, I suppose, is it's been difficult for outsiders to really kind of pick, you know, kind of one particular strand of opinion and say, right, we totally support this. They come along with a message saying we support all, you know, and, and but there are significant differences between the various groups. Um, and I, I mean, I absolutely understand that, you know, having a leadership that is a sort of a Hong Kong protest group means you are going to be targeted as Joshua Wong and, and obviously Martin Lee have. Um, and that's very, very unfortunate. Um, but it, at the end of the day, that's politics. It's uh, always been kind of Hong Kong struggle. And the moral support from the West has been conditional. 
and uh, you know, at the moment is conditional on the economic circumstances in which it's in, and we have to be realistic about that. If I have a question, it's a rather an open question, but one thing that struck me is that uh, Professor Brown mentioned that with leaving the EU, the UK cannot really take advantage of uh, any statement or reaction from the EU. But I think uh, the remark yesterday of uh, your foreign minister, Dominic Raab, uh, about um, HSBC and distancing himself from uh, um, distancing the UK government from what HSBC has been doing um, shows that uh, the UK is now free to make its own statement and what the, the UK says on Hong Kong is, of course, extremely important. Um, Having said that, my question was really also uh, following, as uh, what Professor Brown said, the importance of businesses and uh, the influence of the financial market. In that respect, in my introduction, I mentioned how difficult it is for the big company CEOs to um, just not toe the line. The companies have to abide by the local laws, and it is very clear that HSBC and Standard Chartered didn't have much choice. But I think, in a way, there may be an opportunity, there may be a way out, and that is if adherence to democratic values would be part of the ESG criteria, then that could make a big difference. After all, we've seen Cafe Pacific, and I think the big banks also telling their employees, you cannot be vocal on social media or on the streets about your own opinion about what is going on. And I think in that respect, they, they they do not respect the, the 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 right of these people to speak out, and I believe this could be marked against their social against their environmental and social government scorecard, the ESG scorecard. And um, I think investors, the collective power of investors, is uh, I think extremely important because the emperors may make the laws, but I think for big CEOs uh, of, of big companies. The share price is still king. So, come on, let's have the, uh, the investors also work as activists. It could help the situation. My question is, of course, is this a feasible idea, yes or no? Of course. Uh, it needs consensus, though, on what, um, you know, what the input into the Hong Kong issue is and what people want from it. Um, so, we know Beijing's red lines, which are very, very clear. You know, it's becoming tougher and tougher. Um, and, you know, kind of Hong Kong is now what, two, two and a half percent of its economy, but there are some things that matter to it about Hong Kong. I guess we need to have consensus on Europe, you know, kind of an America on what their vision for Hong Kong is and, you know, where their red line is. And, I mean, I guess that's emerging. If the UK can take leadership on that, for sure. Uh, what I meant really was, you know, that the UK within the European Union did have a leadership role when it was a member, and, you know, therefore, it kind of really helped build that consensus. HSBC and the Standard Chart are coming, uh, are coming out to uh, publicly support the uh, legislation the um, propose a national security law. I think it would be uh, somewhat easier for the Taiwanese people to understand that. Um, what I'm trying to say is, um, over the past many years, uh, there are numerous cases involving Taiwanese businessmen working in Chinese women uh, who were forced uh, to publicly express their support to the so-called 1992 consensus or the uh, peaceful unification. Well, these are the people who have a long-term relationship, close relationship with our uh, ruling party now, the PPP. They are very well known to the Taiwanese people of their so-called green background, but they were forced uh, to to make uh, a public uh, uh, a statement to show their obedience, uh, to show their obedience to the CCP. Uh, I think that is something that they have to do. Uh, they, they, they are kept in to the Beijing pressure is uh, expedient. It's for them to win time to, to adjust. Uh, for uh, just how, to what extent uh, this applies to HSBC or Center Charter, I don't know. But people vote by foot. You know, what they say uh, is for the time being, uh, if they don't say that, probably 
they they are taking their own graves, their their business will be at risk in Hong Kong. No no business can operate successfully uh, that goes against the government, especially so in a dictatorship. And so uh, for them to to have an expedient measure to say yes to Beijing now, but then probably what they are going to do you now you know, silently is to think about moving their capital away or doing a, a, a thinking about the next step uh, to 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 move to some place a sector like the Singapore or somewhere else. They, I, I know some of them even moved to mainland China because mainland China, after all, is already a state country. Now they they have to use that kind of standard to start their business in mainland China. But in Hong Kong, where they are in a better situation now, can only go from worse to, to from bad to worse. I would like to thank you all for your interest in the EIAS and our.